Thank you very much. I'm Senator Mary Lou McFedrin, an independent senator from Manitoba, which is Treaty 1 territory and the homeland of the Métis Nation. I'm speaking to you today as the moderator of this uh, press conference, and I'm in Ottawa, so I am on the unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabeg peoples on which the Parliament of Canada is situated. I have a brief introduction to make, and that is to point out that Canada has now had an entrenched, constitutionalized charter of rights and freedoms, and four decades of litigation interpreting that charter. We have seen some triumphs in the 40 years, and we have seen disappointments. But what we know for sure, and critics of the Charter, supporters of the Charter, optimists about the Charter, all agree that this is an essential part of our country, of this constitutional democracy. And for those who lived through the siege of downtown Ottawa around the Parliament buildings not that long ago, it was very clear that the Charter had become a symbol of a certain kind of freedom, and certain freedoms for certain people. And so this only underscores for us the importance of a conversation like we are going to have here today, a conversation about some of the practical realities, the living of rights, or the denial of the living of rights that is experienced at the individual level, at the community level, and the struggle and the quest for creating more fairness in our society. And I want to also point out that this is actually not about some small L liberal or any other label notion of what rights are. What the research tells us is that a rights-based democracy is a more productive democracy, is a more stable democracy. And as we stand with Ukrainian people in this time of an illegal invasion that now we seek increasing documentation of war crimes, it heightens for people in Canada how precious our rights are and how precious our democracy is and how interlinked rights and a viable democracy are. So without further ado, let me introduce the panelists today. The first speaker is going to be Fareed Khan, who is the founder of Canadians United Against Hate, followed by uh, Alex Sehama, the executive director of the Canadian Congress on Diversity. And after Alex, we'll hear from Thomas Woodley, the president of Canadians for Justice and Peace in the Middle East. And closing off our panel will be Professor John Packer, who is the Director of the University of Ottawa Human Rights Research and Education Centre. And so now, uh, Fareed, for your comments, please. Uh, thank you, Senator. Just a correction. Um, Aaron Lakoff will speak after uh, Thomas Woodley and before Professor Packer. I, yes, thank you. I think so, that's what I said, but sure. Okay, sorry, no, I, I think uh, you, you, know, you missed that, but uh, thank you. Uh, merci, Centrice McFedrin, d'être nous, avec nous aujourd'hui, à cette occasion pour soutenir les droits humains et pour votre histoire de défense des droits humains pendant votre carrière. Dans un esprit de réconciliation avec nos frères et sœurs autochtones, je tiens à souligner que je parle aujourd'hui du territoire non cédé du peuple, euh, peuple Anishinaabe Algonquin à Ottawa. Je suis accompagné aujourd'hui par, euh, par des amis et alliés pour mar marquer une journée historique, le 40e anniversaire de la Charte des droits et libertés. 40 years ago, on April 17th, Canadians watched as Queen Elizabeth II and then Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau put their signatures on the Canadian Constitution in a ceremony on the lawn of Parliament Hill. Those signatures also gave this country the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, a foundational document that affects all Canadians, and a symbol of pride for 93% of Canadians, according to a poll done a few years ago. Since it was proclaimed, the rights of Canadians have been reinforced with various unconstitutional laws 
being struck down since 1982. Until the charter came into force, parliament, legislatures, and ultimately, ultimately politicians had the final say in whether or not human rights were protected. They could take actions that violated fundamental freedoms, with those affected having little recourse to defend themselves. Examples of past policies that egregiously violated fundamental rights were the head tax on Chinese immigrants, the internment of Japanese Canadians during World War II, and denying the right to vote to Indigenous people until the 1960s. The Charter was supposed to change things by removing the ability of governments, politicians, and public agencies to arbitrarily violate people's rights. And while the Charter has been a positive development for Canadian law, it hasn't achieved its full potential. Despite the Charter, governments and politicians have repeatedly and knowingly violated the rights of Canadian communities and individuals over the past 40 years. Even after 1982, successive governments continue to violate the rights of Indigenous children and their families as residential schools continue to operate until 1997. In the early 2000s, Muslims uh, felt uh, uh, were targeted as well. Muslim Canadians Meher Arar and Omar Khadr suffered horribly when their charter rights were violated. Canadian officials were complicit in Arar being imprisoned and tortured in Syria for supposed connections to Al-Qaeda, and the rights of former child soldier Khadr were also violated when he was illegally imprisoned for 10 years in America's Guantanamo Bay prison, where he was tortured with the complicity of Canadian officials. Across Canada, there have also been frequent incidents where the charter rights of Black Canadians and Indigenous people have been repeatedly violated by police. In July 2016, Abdurrahman Abdi, a black man with mental health issues from Ottawa, died after being beaten by police during his arrest. The officer charged uh, criminally for this was acquitted at trial. In June 2020, police in New Brunswick shot two Indigenous people, Chantal Moore and Rodney Levy, during a wellness check. Despite calls from Indigenous leaders for charges to be laid, Moore's and Levy's families did not receive justice. And since 2019, the Quebec government has willfully violated the charter rights of racialized religious minorities with its Bill 21 secularism law, and federal leaders have enabled those violations by not forcefully challenging the law or directly referring it to the Supreme Court. These are just a handful of examples which demonstrate that the existence of the charter is no guarantee that the rights of Canadians are protected. They show that certain politicians are willing to sacrifice the rights of Canadians if it's politically expedient. Yes, we do need to celebrate the Charter of Rights on this very important anniversary and acknowledge the critical role it played in expanding human rights protections for Canadians. But as Canadians, we must also realize that to keep these rights, we need to stand up in defense of them anytime they are threatened. Moving forward, we need to be on guard against those politicians and public officials who believe that the rights of some Canadians, especially racialized Canadians, are of less value than others. If the Charter is to live up to its potential and promise in the coming decades, then it's up to all Canadians to make sure that defense of fundamental rights in Canada becomes a core value for us all, and that we ensure that those seeking public office are committed to defending our Charter rights without equ equivocation. It's up to Canadians to make this happen as we mark 40 years of the Charter, by calling on governments and political leaders to stand up for our Charter rights without exception, and make sure they defend the fundamental freedoms that some would rather ignore. Thank you very much. Merci. Um, could we now hear from Alex Hama, please, the Executive Director of the Canadian Congress on Diversity. Alex? Well, thank you so much. Yes, I'm here. Thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to contribute to this uh, very, very important conversation and to my dear friend Farid for uh, working to put this together. Um, as you already uh, said, uh, 40 years ago, a group of, let's not forget, a group of five white men, right? Let's not forget uh, the people that came together. Pierre Trudeau, I believe, Jean Chrétien, Roy Romanoff, Roy McMurty, and Bill Davis. They came together and formulated this, of course, with their teams to formulate this Charter of Rights and Freedom, which we should be proud of. Their intention, though, 
may have had some merit. However, uh, they did not obviously consider the perspectives and needs of all Canadians. How do I know that? In fact, there were groups of Canadians today who, were, who did not have a voice when this were put together. There are groups of Canadians uh, today who were neither consulted nor even considered in the development of this document uh, to further entrench what I call Eurocentric values and colonial mentality. Um, which community group or religious group or which group uh, that fall under the underrepresented was consulted 40 years ago? Uh, 40 years ago, I probably wouldn't even have this voice. Indigenous people were considered savages, documented 40 years ago. 40 years ago, there were racist policies and laws and miseducation. Um, 40 years ago, uh, Canada uh, may have considered themselves a holy land void of racism and discrimination that we see across the border, yet existed right here in our midst, which still do. 40 years ago, women, which who are still struggling, by the way, were even more struggling then in the workplaces, 40 years ago, 40 years ago. So when we talk about the Charter of Rights and Freedom, we must remember that the environment, the people, the framework upon which it was built simply was inequitable, unjust, and frankly, I could even say oppressive, because how could we put together a Charter of Rights when there were people who still don't have rights, and certainly 40 years ago had none, they were considered savages, and I and I pay respect to the thousands of people who were who are still being murdered, and or those who were who were part of the genocide of the residential school. Um, Why we celebrate this milestone today? I believe I believe the time has come to reevaluate the Charter of Rights. I believe the time has come to even form a committee of people who fully represent the beautiful diversity that we see in Canada today so that it can be completely inclusive and representative of all the needs and experiences. We are the Canadian Congress right here. What we do is help organizations uh, to review policies, to write policies, diversity policy and uh, human resources policy and affinity groups and all these fine things we do, training and all these things to help organizations to have a more inclusive and cohesive culture. But my question is, who is doing this for the prime minister with all due respect and his cohort of Eurocentric values? Who is doing this? I want to appreciate Farid today, and Farid, thank you, and thank you to all the fellow speakers for the opportunity to participate, as I said, in this critical conversation. But it is time that we move from celebration to action. It is time that we look at, when we consider the rate of suicide in Canada is high, when we consider the lack of clean, uh, clean drinking water in the co uh, indigenous community for far too long, when we consider that within the last two to three years, the people who identify as African descent, black people in prisons have increased over 80%. Which charter of rights is protecting them? Over 80%. So what are we truly celebrating today is my question. What are we celebrating? Section eight of the legal rights states that everyone, 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 everyone has the right to be secure against unreasonable search and seizure. I don't need research. I, 80% of my time before the uh, virus is out, I, I do international travels. Alex, but from my own personal up, experience, please? could you wrap yes, up, please? From my own personal experience, yes, from my own personal experience, from my own personal experience, I continue to be pulled out uh, for, uh, for, for, the, for search. And, and they tell me it is, it is, it is a random search. Yes, I will wrap, wrap up and quote uh, uh, Martin Luther King in his, in his acceptance speech in the auditorium of the University of Oslo, December 10, 1964. He said, I refuse to accept the cynical notion that nation after nation must spiral down a militaristic uh, stairway in the hell of thermonuclear destruction. I believe that unarmed truth, he said, and unconditional love we have is final reality. So I say that even as we celebrate the, the, the document, the Charter of Rights, it is time to reevaluate it and ensure that it is inclusive, it's equitable, and certainly represent the Canadians that did not have a voice when it was created. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you, Alex. Um, if I could hear now, please, from Thomas Woodley, the President of Canadians for Justice and Peace in the Middle East. Thomas? Yes, good afternoon. My name is Thomas Woodley, and as our Ho said, I'm president of Canadians for Justice and Peace in the Middle East. 
Uh, based in Montreal, I live on the unceded territory of the Kenyan Kahaka Nation, and it's important to note that this area where I live has been uh, a meeting place for First Nations in the region for millennia. I'm standing in for my colleague, Ms. Noor Watad, who unfortunately has fallen ill and is unable to represent us at this important media conference. This weekend on April 17th, Canadians for Justice and Peace in the Middle East commemorates the 40th anniversary of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. At the same time, we acknowledge that many of the protections guaranteed by the Charter are not fully enjoyed by many Canadian citizens. In fact, in these times of extreme political polarization, populist leaders and popular fear-mongering, the rights of certain minorities are more tenuous than they've been in years. When originally conceived, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms defined those rights and freedoms that Canadians deem necessary for a free and democratic society. Nevertheless, deep issues of prejudice and discrimination continue to plague our Canadian society. For example, my organization has been involved in significant efforts to raise the issue of anti-Arab racism in Canada. Last year, in partnership with the Canadian Arab, Canadian Arab Federation and the Arab Canadian Lawyers Association, we commissioned an ECOS public opinion survey on anti-Arab racism in Canada. The results were sobering. The survey revealed that a striking 79% of Canadians acknowledge that prejudice against Arab Canadians is a problem. Survey respondents also acknowledge that the many factors that they acknowledge the many factors that negatively affect Arab Canadians' ability to find work. In fact, 64% of Canadians believe that simply having a name that sounds Arab could have a negative effect on an Arab Canadian's job prospects. These are just two examples of the many grave findings of the survey. My organization has also been involved in, with efforts to combat Islamophobia in Canada. In 2018, in partnership with the Canadian Muslim Forum, we commissioned an eco-survey on Islamophobia in Canada. The survey confirmed that Islamophobia and religious discrimination generally are troubling problems in Canada, of course. For example, 81% of Canadians acknowledge that Islamophobia exists in Canada. But the survey also showed how attitudes on the topic are so extremely politically polarized. For example, around 50% of liberal NDP and Green Party supporters consider religious discrimination against their fellow Muslim citizens to be a significant problem, whereas only 14% of conservative supporters do. Of course, beyond public opinion surveys, there are many concrete examples of anti-Arab and Islamophobic attitudes in, in, in Canada. Quebec's Law 21 is one of the most egregious examples of Islamophobia. The law bans Quebec teachers, lawyers, police officers, and more from wearing religious garbs, such as crosses, hijabs, and turbans. This not only affects people currently employed in the public sector, but also young people who aspire to such careers. Unfortunately, the, all these issues ex exist despite Canada's Charter, Charter of Rights and Freedoms. There have been some positive steps taken by the government to address the underlying issues, but progress is painfully and unnecessarily slow. The government must be a better advocate for vulnerable groups and must do better in many of the areas targeted for improvement. For example, better reporting on hate crimes, new tools to help religious minorities overcome racism in the employment marketing, more funding for public awareness programs on religious discrimination, and diversity training for public servants. As a Canadian organization, CJP is proud and thankful for the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. But with the realities our society faces today, we are compelled to call on the federal and provincial governments to be much better at recognizing and, addresses the, and addressing the deep issues of prejudice and discrimination that continue to plague our society. Thank you. Um, if we could now hear from Aaron Lakoff, the Communications and Media Lead of Independent Jewish Voices Canada. Aaron, please. Hi there. Thank you so much for uh, the invitation to speak here today. Um, so as mentioned, uh, I work for Independent Jewish Voices Canada. I'm also joining you today from unceded uh, Ganyagahaga territory in uh, Jojage or Montreal. Um, so IJV or Independent Jewish Voices is a group of Jews from across Canada who primarily are involved in Palestine solidarity work. We, we proudly say not in our name um, in you know, opposing Israeli occupation and, and apartheid. That's a lot of the work that we do, but we're also very involved in struggles against racism, Islamophobia, and white supremacy and anti-Semitism here at home. Uh, my colleague Thomas Woodley already mentioned Bill 21, so you know I, I don't want to um, kind of repeat too much what's already been said. But what I will say is that. Bill 21, unfortunately, here in Quebec, where I live, has been, you know, one of the main ways that Islamophobia has really been manifested over the last few years. And it's it's really quite concerning. And it's created a culture of toxicity and, and fear in, in a place that 
I've always been so proud to call home that I know that so many other Muslims and, and Jews and, and Sikh people have also been proud to call home and, and now are essentially being told that they're not equals in the society, that they're somehow less Quebecois or Canadian than other people just because they they choose to assert that that freedom of, of expression and freedom of religion. Um, you know, Bill 21, it, it, it's helped to fuel a dangerous rise in, in anti-Semitism, in, in, in far-right extremist groups in Quebec in the last few years. We've seen that in, in groups like La Meute and Storm Alliance and even like the openly fascist group Atalante in Quebec City. We can't mince words with Bill 21. It's Islamophobic, it's anti-Semitic, it's sexist. And, you know, we have to know that it's had a particularly devastating impact on Muslim women. And despite these impacts, despite the fact that Muslim women have either, you know, been sent off the job or have had to leave the province of Quebec just for being Muslim women, and again, for asserting basic rights of freedom of expression, the premier of Quebec, Francois Legault, continues to deny the existence of systemic racism in Quebec. So I would say shame on him for continuing to deny that. In the last few years, IJV has been proud to support movements against Islamophobia and racism. We've supported the incredible Black Lives Matter mobilizations that have happened uh, over the last few summers and, and going back even further. Uh, we supported Muslim communities in challenging Bill 21 in the courts. You know, we were out in the streets with thousands of other Canadians when Israel was bombing Gaza last May. I mean, these are these are incredible movements that that rally people, that inspire and and, and bring us together to to really actually assert the core values of, of the charter. So, you know, I'll just in closing, I'll say the Charter of Rights and Freedoms is a strong promise, but it's an unfulfilled promise. And when governments violate our basic rights and freedoms, we need to get organized as communities to defend ourselves and defend communities such as the Jewish community or the Muslim community or any other community that comes under attack. And, and IJV will always be proud to stand with these communities who are opposing racism until these basic freedoms that are guaranteed in the charter actually become a reality for all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, Aaron, and I, I want to, um, before turning this over to Professor John Packer, just go to one of the points that Alex made um, a number of times, uh, um, Alex, with the Canadian Congress on, on diversity, and that was harking back to 40 years ago and what was the situation 40 years ago. I'd just like to acknowledge that I was involved in the drafting of some of the, uh, in particular, Section 28, the Sex Equality Clause protection in the Charter, and was very involved for many months um, as a lobbyist on behalf of um, the concept of, of sex equality and other equality rights in the Charter. And um, I, I think that what I, what I would like to point out is that the, the Charter and the Constitution has a long life. And the fact that some of what was negotiated and put into law 40 years ago, we have yet to see the full use or the full development of some of these sections. The reference that's been made to Bill 21 raises a very interesting question because we are seeing more governments in Canada talking about using the Section 33 override clause as a way to disrespect or not acknowledge certain rights. And the clause does allow for that. There's actually only one of the articulated rights in the Charter that is not subject to Section 33 in terms of equality rights, and that is uh, in Section 28. And so I'm going to ask Professor John Packer, a longtime scholar of both international and Canadian constitutional law, for comments at this point, please. Professor Packer. Well, thank you very much, uh, Senator McFedrin. Uh, first of all, for your uh, uh, allowing us to share this platform and for your use in the public interest of this platform. And uh, let me say it's also an honor to join the uh, co-panelists and to express our views, uh, which is, of course, a, a precious 
uh, freedom and uh, a right uh, that we enjoy in Canada. And we should also uh, acknowledge that many other people in the world do not enjoy that. Let me thank you personally, Senator McVedrin, for your constant uh, lifelong engagement, uh, your example, and your leadership, uh, both open-hearted and open-mindedly, uh, but also your determination and your specific contributions, which uh, I know uh, far exceeded just like what you mentioned, uh, not only with regard to the, the charter itself, and uh, more than sections, uh, tw section 28, uh, but also your involvement uh, in the implementation, which is really, really the nub of the matter, Fine words on paper, they may be, and they may not be sufficient even in that regard, but really the question is, to what degree are these realized and are actually lived and enjoyed uh, by all those who should be subject to them? And so I, I wish, uh, secondly, to acknowledge and uh, pay enormous respect for all the people in the last 40 years, uh, yourself included, in different institutions for the protection of human rights in Canada, ombudsperson offices, commissions on human rights, uh, uh, civil society organizations, uh, government uh, officials who, who uh, fulfilled their duty and uh, acted in a way which was consonant with, with the uh, Charter uh, to help Canadians and help anyone, uh, everyone within the jurisdiction of Canada uh, to, to uh, take steps closer to the, the vision, the promise that uh, Aaron referred to in, in the Charter. And there are many such persons, and we should not we should not be disrespectful on this day of their efforts uh, in the past and still today. Uh, I, I, I would be remiss without acknowledging, of course, the unceded and unsurrendered uh, land in which I'm speaking at the University of Ottawa, Anishinaabe, uh, Algonquin uh, land, of which I have the privilege to address you from. Uh, indeed, uh, just to pick up some of the points made by colleagues that uh, that the Charter uh, developed 40 years ago, in fact, before 40 years ago, it was promulgated 40 years ago, uh, was in an era uh, that uh, many things have changed. The internet did not exist 40 years ago. Uh, I mean, uh, Rachel Carson, of course, had written her great book on Silent Spring long ago, but, uh, but, but it was not part of common parlance to talk about the environment and certainly climate change and things like that. The inter Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change at the United Nations was only created 24 years ago, I think it was 1998 or 1999. So, uh, so a lot has changed. Uh, social media didn't exist. Uh, um, it, it issues about uh, protection of persons abroad. We have much more integration of people coming and going in our society and so forth. So many things have changed. Our population, uh, Alex will appreciate this as a personal example, our population has almost doubled. We, we've increased by two thirds in actual numbers, but the actual population today, uh, more than half of it, it was not born or was not in this country at the time. So our diversity has changed, our actual presence of uh, composition has changed, and therefore it is appropriate to talk about not only uh, observing and, uh, and celebrating the, the achievement, and it was a definite and significant achievement uh, in 1982 to include the Charter, but to also to uh, assess uh, and to reflect uh, and to say that there are gaps, there are issues uh, which need to be addressed. As, as uh, Farid Khan correctly said, for 15 years uh, since we had the Charter, we still had Indian residential schools. That is, that is a a frightening statement, uh, an embarrassing statement, uh, and obviously enormous uh, amount that needs to be done, the, the Child and Family Services case that was uh, only finally, finally acknowledged by our federal government has still yet to be actually negotiated in terms of uh, uh, fair compensation and so forth. So in concluding, let me just say that, uh, that we have something, we do have something precious. We must acknowledge it is not, uh, it is not uh, a, a panacea. It, is, it has gaps, it has shortcomings. And for far too many Canadians, the, this idea and promise is out of reach and is not actually enjoyed. And it is that that I wish to leave uh, uh, viewers today uh, in the media with, the idea that it is up to us. It is our actual uh, privilege to be able to, in our country, in our society, contribute to this uh, realization of the vision and the promise of the Charter uh, and all the ideas behind it for everyone throughout our country uh, in the in now and in the years to come. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and thank you to each and every one of the panelists. Um, we have time for questions or comments, if anybody wishes to um, do so. Thank you. 
If you have a question on the Zoom, uh, please uh, use the function raise your hand. I don't see any raised hand right now. OK, donc on a une question de Marco bélair Cirino du Devoir. Oui, bonjour. Est-ce que vous m'entendez? Est-ce que je peux poser ma question en français? Est-ce que ça vous va? Oui. Parfait. OK. Bon, mais très bien. Je suis heureux de, 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 de le savoir. Euh, je me demandais, vous, vous avez fait référence, euh, plusieurs d'entre vous, à la loi sur la laïcité de l'État québécois, la loi 21, qui, euh, le lendemain de son adoption par l'Assemblée nationale et sa sanction par le lieutenant-gouverneur du Québec, a été contestée devant la Cour supérieure. Maintenant, la loi se trouve devant la Cour d'appel du Québec. Elle va sans doute se retrouver devant la Cour suprême du Canada. Mais il n'y a pas là un problème, c'est-à-dire le délai de traitement des causes euh, dans la mesure où peut-être que la Cour suprême va en invalider certaines parties qui ne sont pas à l'abri euh, de la clause dérogatoire, à l'abri de contestation en vertu de la clause dérogatoire. Mais certaines personnes ont revu leur plan de vie, certaines euh, femmes de confession musulmane, mais d'autres confessions aussi qui portent leur signe religieux et tiennent à le faire, ont renoncé à une euh, carrière en enseignement. Et lorsque la Cour suprême aura rendu son jugement, mais il sera peut-être trop tard pour ces personnes-là. Euh, donc, je me demandais, est-ce qu'il ne devrait pas y avoir un mécanisme de contrôle constitutionnel beaucoup plus tôt que ce qui est prévu depuis maintenant 40 ans. Who would like to answer that? Okay, I'm seeing Professor uh, Packer uh, start to. <laughs> Please. Uh, uh, je suis prêt à répondre, mais peut-être je voudrais uh, juste demander si Aaron, uh, uh, comme un uh, citoyen uh, de Québec, est touché directement par uh, la loi applicable. Si, si tu veux répondre en première place, et puis je je vais ajouter quelque chose. Non, vas-y, John, parce que comme sur les questions de délai, moi, je ne suis pas expert en droit, puis euh, peut-être vous serez un peu mieux placé à répondre. OK. Euh, merci beaucoup pour la question. Et à mon avis, c'est une question très, très importante et euh, touche directement la euh, question des droits droit de la personne euh, qui sont dans, dans, leur, euh, dans leur idée euh, de base euh, euh, un minimum, une, une notion de protection Uh, uh, profonde uh, et qui ne peut pas être soumis d'une dérogation, par exemple. À mon avis, notre constitution, je, je, je peux uh, vous partager que j'avais eu la, la chance de contribuer de l'élaboration d'autres constitutions dans le monde qui incluent uh, uh, la constitution uh, ukrainienne uh, en 1996. Et uh, c'est quelque chose de déjà uh, étonnant que notre constitution a une clause uh, de dérogation qui n'est pas applicable dans une, euh, une situation extrême, euh, par, par, par exemple une menace euh, euh, contre la nation une, une, euh, une, euh, euh, ou une guerre, euh, mais c'est juste une décision euh, politique, une décision des politiciens, comme euh, Farid Khan l'a mentionné, euh, pour quelques raisons, mais, mais je, je constate que c'est limité. Mais en tout cas, ça pose un problème... Euh, originel, je peux dire, de notre constitution. C'est très, très euh, euh, bizarre euh, de, comme euh, une question de constitution euh, euh, comparable. Euh, donc, euh, après ça, euh, vous avez posé la question des moyens pour protéger euh, les droits. Et nous avons des institutions comme euh, la Commission euh, en Québec au niveau de, province, de, de la province, mais aussi euh, fédéral euh, pour les, les, les constitutions du Canada. Euh, nous avons une commission, euh, il y a une commission euh, équivalente euh, au niveau provincial du Québec et d'autres moyens euh, pour prendre euh, dans, dans leur propre main euh, l'obligation de protéger. Et, et, et ici, nous avons un, un cas euh, bizarre euh, où le gouvernement euh, agit de, de, de l'autre euh, côté pour... Euh, à réduire euh, les protections. Et, et ça, c'est aussi une question euh, euh, très tout, troublante pour moi. Et, et bien sûr, pour rester euh, seulement pour des recours euh, au cours, ça, c'est aussi un autre problème parce que ça prend du temps. Et les recours, euh, il y a des dépenses liées, il y a, ça prend du temps et tout ça. Donc, ce n'est pas tout à fait l'idée de protéger les droits fondamentaux, euh, les fondamentaux comme, euh, comme euh, par exemple, euh, la pratique de la, de la religion. 
Donc, euh, pour moi, il y a bien sûr une conversation plus large euh, de prendre ici au Canada et aussi pour euh, réengager, euh, pour protéger, assurer tous les citoyens, tous les gens, ce n'est pas une question des citoyens, les gens dans notre euh, pays pour être vraiment protégés. Um, I think we have a question here, please, sir. Euh, Est-ce que Marco avait une question de suivi, euh, juste vérifier avant? Ben, ben, rapidement, je me demandais si... Euh, Qu'est-ce que vaut une charte canadienne des droits et libertés lorsqu'il existe une clause dérogatoire? Est-ce qu'on devrait, dans le fond, euh, pour donner vraiment le, du mordant à cette charte-là, abolir la clause dérogatoire, selon vous? Euh, C'est une question de, euh, par exemple, comme euh, euh, la sénatrice, sénatrice a déjà euh, indiqué, euh, pour nos euh, cours, euh, décider euh, sur euh, un rapport de cas, malheureusement, euh, pour, euh, par exemple, euh, donner les contraintes euh, de l'utilisation de ce clause dérogatoire parce que c'est presque illimité. Après chaque cinq années, euh, il peut continuer. Et donc, est-ce qu'il y a vraiment euh, un euh, droit euh, reliable euh, pour, euh, pour les citoyens, pour les gens? Euh, donc, pour moi, il y a un problème dedans, euh, le clause de régatoire. Ce n'est pas tout à fait euh, euh, capable d'être résolu totalement, mais je crois qu'on peut essayer de euh, réduire euh, la liberté pour le, le, le gouvernement d'utiliser ce clause. OK. Uh, question dans la salle, question in, question in the room. Uh, Tom Korski, Black Locks. Uh, Mr. Khan, this is for you. I'm struck that outside of a casual reference by the moderator, no one mentioned Cabinet's invocation of the Emergencies Act, February 14th. That seems like an odd omission for this panel. And I wondered why, Mr. Khan, I looked up your social media accounts. You described the Freedom Convoy protesters as human slime, I'm quoting. You said that uh, plaintiffs awaiting bail hearings charged with mischief, quote, deserve uh, to spend years in jail. You said any publicly funded employee, including a nurse who donated a penny to the Freedom Convoy, needs to be removed from their job. That was on uh, February 16th on your Twitter account. And you said any conservative MP who supported protesters needs to be arrested. Mr. Khan, that's a little bit rough coming from an advocate of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Could you comment? Yeah, I don't think I ever used the term human slime. Um, I'd like you to uh, send that to me if uh, where, I, where I posted that. But yeah, I was harsh. I was harsh on the protesters. This was a protest organized by people with a known history of racism, white supremacy, Islamophobia, anti-Semitism. They allowed um, white supremacists and neo-Nazis to march around freely uh, within the protest. They had no problem with that. And frankly, the politicians who stood by these uh, protest organizers and enabled them and encouraged them, in my view, were committing sedition under the criminal code. And, you know, look up the sections. Um, you know, these are people, the people who organized the protest and supported the protest were calling for the overthrow of the government. And frankly, um, the people who were uh, victims of that protest and occupation in downtown Ottawa, you know, they didn't deserve what happened to them. We get hundreds of protests in Ottawa every year. Some are very, very um, aggressive. I think we like, can move know, on, Mr. Uh, Khan. I, I, I think you've answered my question. The slime was on your Twitter account on February 17th. Does no one here agree with the Canadian Civil Liberties Association's challenge of the invocation of the Emergencies Act in federal court? Does nobody here think that's a good idea, whether you like truck drivers or not? And is there nobody here who wanted to join the 15 civil rights petitioners yesterday who asked Cabinet for a clear above-board inquiry into why they invoked the Emergencies Act Forget about what the truck drivers said on Facebook. 15 groups petitioned cabinet yesterday. Professor, take it away. Uh, I, I'm quite happy to respond to this. Uh, I think that it is extraordinary that the Emergency Act uh, was invoked in the circumstances it was invoked uh, at a very uh, late moment and then last moment. You may know that the Emergency Act, uh, which was rewritten, uh, I forget how many years ago, 15 years ago or something, 
like that. It explicitly foresaw uh, circumstances such as we're living in, for example, health and so forth. Uh, and the act itself is explicitly limited uh, to respect. It may, may not, for example, suspend uh, charter rights and so forth. So um, it, it did strike me as a, a kind of extraordinary thing to occur that it was not invoked at <laughs> circumstances that may have merited it, as some colleagues of mine actually suggested long ago, and then was uh, was invoked. I, I, I would characterize it more as a kind of political reaction at a very last moment circumstance. And then, as you know, um, uh, uh, actually withdrawn uh, even before it was properly debated in Parliament. So I do think that it's very problematical, and I actually welcome that it should be challenged, and the courts should have some uh, position to say some some uh, opportunity to say something about it. I think that's essential in our democracy. But do let me add, uh, add one other thing here. Uh, there is a lot of, uh, and I think it's a good moment for us to reflect on this to, at the 40th anniversary of our charter. There was an enormous amount of confusion in the, in the public uh, space, in, in the public square, with invocations of right to protest and so forth. There is no explicit, expresses verbis, right to protest, uh, for example, in our, in our constitution. Uh, however, the, the notion of a right to protest absolutely does exist. It's a, a very core in human rights to rebel against uh, excessive abuse of authority and so forth uh, as a result uh, or a combination of a number of freedoms, freedom of association, freedom of assembly, freedom of expression, freedom of movement. And uh, understanding the relation of these and the very notion of freedom uh, is something that clearly uh, not enough Canadians understand, uh, neither in our government nor in, in the public square. And I note that Mr. Khan mentioned that something like 93% of Canadians, uh, the, the charter resonates positively with them. I would invite that more and more people need to read it and we need to have more public education about it. And I do welcome if there is more specific articulation from, from the judiciary on this. Um, just to point out that the day on which the declaration was ended by the government, um, there was already a, a movement among a significant number of senators and MPs, including some Liberals, um, to come up with the requisite signatures um, to begin the process of, of ending the, uh, the declarations. And um, that we didn't end up having to do that. Um, the government was well aware that we were fairly far along in, in um, creating that joint letter that was required under this, the particular section. Um, and instead, there was the decision to, to, uh, to suspend. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we um, don't. We've reached our appointed time of, of ending now. So, uh, did we have any questions? No, we don't have any more questions. So, I don't know if you have a closing remark. My closing remark would really to be the the need for these kinds of conversations, for the range of experiences that have been articulated here today, with uh, almost an equal number of different perspectives. But really what it boils down to is that we have a living charter, a living constitution. Forty years ago, many of the interpretations that seem to make sense no longer make sense for Canadian society as it is now. And probably one of the single most important takeaways of this conversation is that Canada has become a more diverse country, but it has also become an old country. The census has indicated to us that we actually have more older people than younger people in this country, and that for many younger people, the charter is a symbol, but the degree to which they understand the charter, the degree to which they actually apply interpretations of the charter to their own lives is probably smaller in number than what we want to see. And so leaving here today, well, I'm hoping that where we have consensus is the need not only for awareness raising, but actually for much deeper, stronger civics education, charter-based education, not only in our schools, not only in our, our higher education institutions, but throughout our society. Because if we don't know our rights, we cannot live our rights. So with a great thank you to Fareed Khan, 
Alex Ahama, Thomas Woodley, Aaron Lakoff, and John Packer. Thank you for taking the time today. Thank you for engaging in this conversation. And thank you to the media for the attention that you have brought to this conversation today. Merci. Miigwech.